Okay, so let's get started. This is our online Spintronic seminar number 101. Our speaker today is Professor Evgeny Zimbel, my colleague here at the University of Nebraska. Uh, Professor Zimbel joined UNL uh, in 2002 as associate professor and then was promoted to full professor of tenure in 2005 and was named Charles Pessy Professor in 2009 and George Holmes University Distinguished Professor in 2013. Uh, prior to his appointment at UNL, he was a senior research scientist at the University of Oxford in the UK, a research fellow of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation at uh, Forschungszentrum Jülich in Germany, and before that, a research scientist at the Russian Research Center Kurchatov Institute in Moscow. Uh, from 2007 to uh, 2021, um, Evgeny served as director of the uh, MERSEC Center, sponsored by NSF uh, at Nebraska. And from 2013 to 2017, he also served as director of the Center for Nanoferroic Devices, which was sponsored jointly by Semiconductor Research Corporation and NIST. Um, Professor Zimbel is a co-editor of a three volume Spintronics handbook, uh, which many of you may be familiar with. Uh, it's a textbook on uh, spin transport and magnetism, which was published in 2019. He's a fellow of the American Physical Society, uh, a fellow of the Institute of Physics, and the recipient of the Outstanding Research and Creative Activity Award uh, from UNL. So the topic of again is talk today will be prediction of a giant tunneling beneath the resistance effect in antiferromagnetic tunnel junctions. And I'll hand it over to you again. Please go ahead. Thank you, Kirill, for this introduction. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this, uh, of this seminar. So in my presentation today, I'm going to dis discuss the concept of uh, anti-ferromagnetic tunnel junctions. And uh, I'm going to show that uh, these tunnel junctions can be used to uh, detect the anti-ferromagnetic order parameter uh, through tunneling magnetic resistance effect. So uh, my presentation will consist of three parts. So first, I will start from introduction where I briefly introduce the concept of anti-ferromagnetic spintronics. Uh, in the second part of my presentation, I will discuss anti-ferromagnetic tunnel junctions with collinear magnetic uh, anti-ferromagnetic electrodes. Uh, and this part of the work was done uh, largely in my group uh, with a significant contribution from Dean Fu Shao, who is currently a professor at the uh, Hefei Institute of Physical Science in China. Uh, in collaboration with my group members, Gotham Gurong and Ming Li, and also in collaboration with Shu Huai Zhang at Beijing University of Chemical, Chemical Technology and uh, Chang Bong Ong at University of Wisconsin Medicine. And the, in the third part of my presentation, I will discuss uh, the idea of antiferromagnetic tunnel junctions with non collinear antiferromagnetic metals. And this part of the work was done. Uh, largely in the group of Jia Zhang uh, at uh, Hua Zhang University of Science and Technology in Wuhan in China. Um, and uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, uh, support of my work, uh, my group work uh, from National Science Foundation and Office of Naval Research. Uh, so let me start from, uh, from the um, idea of uh, anti-ferromagnetic spintronics. Um, so, antiferromagnetic spintronics uh, emerged uh, uh, quite recently uh, as a paradigm to replace uh, ferromagnets with antiferromagnets in spintronic in spintronics applications. So, the idea here is instead of uh, magnetization and ferromagnets, to use uh, the nail vector as a com computational state variable uh, zero or one. For example, in collinear antiferromagnets, uh, we can, in principle, uh, reverse the nail vector, reverse all the magnetic moments, and go from state zero to state one. 
or we can rotate the moments, which would represent uh, state one uh, as compared to, to the original state. The similar idea can be used using non collinear antiferro magnets. So here we can also uh, imagine a reversal of all, uh, all the magnetic moments or rotation of these moments representing zero and one uh, as a computational variable. So one of the major uh, advantages of uh, antiferromagnetic spintronics or antiferromagnets in general as compared to ferromagnets is that they exhibit ultra fast dynamics. So potentially one can switch antiferromagnets on a scale of a picosecond as compared to, uh, to, uh, to ferromagnets, uh, which we can, where we can switch the magnetization on a scale of uh, uh, nanosecond. So this is very important for, from the point of view making uh, fast uh, memory and logic applications. Also, uh, antiferromagnet uh, are robust with magnetic perturbations and have no uh, stray fields, which is also very important uh, from the uh, perspectives of applications because uh, we can make devices, uh, we can pack devices much more denser, uh, again, as compared to uh, uh, ferromagnetic uh, analogs. So one of the uh, major challenges in uh, uh, antiferromagnetic spintronics is that it's much harder to control and detect the main effect as compared to magnetization. Uh, nevertheless, uh, recently there have been quite significant uh, progress, both in uh, in a way we can uh, manipulate the main reactor and also uh, to detect it. Uh, so, for example. Um, uh, one can use an idea of electric control of the nail reactor, which can be achieved uh, quite efficiently in antiferromagnetic materials, which are simultaneously magnetoelectric. And that can be done through magnetoelectric effect by applying an external electric field. In particular, that has been nicely demonstrated for chromium 203 uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a set of uh, publications listed here. Alternatively, we can use uh, piezoelectric materials by combining antiferromagnets with piezoelectrics, like, for example, uh, well known PMNPT, uh, which produces uh, in plane strain under the application of perpendicular electric field, and that uh, may produce um, change in the easy axis and uh, rotate magnetization. So at the same time, uh, there have been some very active work in using spin orbit torque. So we know that uh, spin orbit torques can be efficiently used to switch magnetization ferromagnets. Uh, so it appears that a uh, similar related idea can be used for, uh, for antiferromagnets. I'll give you a few examples here. For example, uh, it was shown that for certain type of antiferromagnets, like, for example, copper manganese arsenide, uh, which have uh, PT symmetry, where right? P stays for uh, space inversion and T stays for time reversal symmetry. Uh, one can produce uh, um, a standard uh, field like torque, which can uh, switch the antiferromagnetic order parameter. Also, um, a spin fall effect may be employed in, in, in the switching of antiferromagnets. So uh, anti-damping uh, anti torque, and that has been shown uh, again in a number of publications using a bio-layer combining heavy metal and, and antiferromagnets. So in parallel, there have been quite substantial progress in detecting the nail vector uh, as well. So uh, most common way to detect the nail vector is to use uh, anisotropic magnetic resistance of effect or it's analog tunneling anisotropic magnetic resistance effect where uh, the uh, resistance depends on, um, on uh, alignment between the uh, current density and the uh, antiferromagnetic order parameter. So similarly, you can do the, uh, you, you can, you can, similar effect can be observed using tunneling effect where you have a thin layer uh, separating antiferromagnet and, uh, and uh, additional magnetic layer. Also, it was uh, shown that uh, quite efficient in detecting the nail reactor is 
uh, effect, which is known uh, as pinhole magnetic resistance effect or S S SMR effect. So here, uh, the uh, current in the uh, in the metal uh, is dependent on uh, mere vector orientation through uh, inverse pinhole effect, which provides uh, some additional comp component to the current uh, across the interface. Depend and this this this. Uh, Contribution depends on the main vector radiation. Uh, so finally, uh, anomalous hole effect was found to be uh, very efficient in uh, detecting the, the male vector. Uh, so the advantage of anomalous hole effect, I would say, uh, as compared to all other effects, is that uh, it uh, changes sign depending on the male vector radiation. But uh, it's limited to certain type of antiferromagnets where uh, by symmetry, uh, we must have an uncompensated magnetic moment. So all these effects have the advantages and disadvantages. So I list some of them here. One of the major disadvantages of AMR and uh, uh, SMR is a relatively weak signal. Also, uh, these effects are sensitive uh, to uh, male vector rotation, but not sensitive to the switching of the antiferromagnetic order parameter, which would be desirable uh, for final applications. So in this regard, anomalous hole effect is more, uh, is, 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 is more advantageous. Uh, it has strong signal and also uh, uh, sensitive to male vector switching. As I said, it's limited by to uncompensated antiferromagnets. And another disadvantage of this is that you need to use three terminal devices. So from the perspective of applications, it would be uh, nice to have something more simple, to have a, a device which has uh, basically um, uh, two electrodes, similar to what we know in ferromagnetic spintronics. And this, uh, this device is a well-known magnetic tunnel junction. So let me briefly describe the, the concept here because it will be relevant to what I'm going to discuss next. So the idea of magnetic tunnel junction is uh, to have a system where we have two thin film uh, ferromagnets which are separated by ultra thin barrier layer uh, such that if you apply a bias voltage, we can have a tunneling current between these two ferromagnetic metal electrodes. So the essence uh, of uh, magnetic tunnel junction and the uh, importance of magnetic tunnel junction is that uh, the resistance of this junction depends on whether you have parallel or anti-parallel aligned uh, magnetic electrodes. And this effect is known as tunneling magnetic resistance. So we can understand uh, tunneling magnetic resistance using uh, a very simple uh, two-spin channel model. So the idea here is that uh, obviously, in ferromagnets, we have uh, different uh, Fermi surfaces for majority and minority spin electrons. So, in a very simple approximation uh, of a free electron light band, these Fermi surfaces are uh, simply uh, circles with uh, different uh, radius. And then, uh, if you assume that our tunneling barrier is sufficiently high, uh, in, a, in a very simple uh, analysis, we can arrive to the result that conductance should be proportional to the product of the Fermi, uh, Fermi, uh, Fermi momentum, Fermi radiators. And in this case, because of a significant disbalance in, in the good ferromagnets between a majority and minority spin Fermi surfaces and the very different Fermi radiators, we should have, we should have much higher transmission uh, for majority spin electrons in parallel aligned uh, electrodes as compared to anti-parallel lines electrodes. So um, uh, one can simply interpret this in, in a qualitative terms uh, in, in a way that we have either matching or mismatching of the Fermi surfaces because uh, in this case uh, majority and majority spin electrons are coupled and the tunneling is allowed between up and up spins in, in both ferromagnets if you now switch the magnetization orientation, uh, we have a mismatch between the Fermi surfaces because uh, the, uh, the spin is, is reversed uh, in, the, in the right electrode. And this mismatch may be considered as uh, 
substantial reduction of resistance for anti a substantial enhancement of resistance for anti parallel uh, minimization. So I'm using this concept because that will be relevant to what I'm going to discuss next. And this, uh, this is the uh, idea of anti-ferromagnetic tunnel junction. So it would be desirable for anti-ferromagnetic spintronics to have uh, such a device where we have uh, two anti-ferromagnets and uh, separated by some uh, barrier layer in such a way that depending on relative orientation of the male reactor, we can have low or high resistance. So very similar idea to what we have in uh, magnetic tunnel junction. Now, the question is whether it's, it's possible to realize or not. So unfortunately, most of the antiferromagnets have um, bands which uh, exhibit Kramer spin degeneracy because most of the antiferromagnets, uh, kind of common antiferromagnets, have a TT one half symmetry. So this is uh, time reversal symmetry combined with one half uh, unit cell trans translation symmetry. Or we can have PT symmetry, as I've mentioned before. In both cases, uh, this symmetry uh, enforce Kramer spin degeneracy, which means that all, all, all the bands are double degenerate. Obviously, from bulk perspective, uh, of this of this kind of antiferromagnets because of this uh, spin degeneracy we should have spin independent conduction. So I, I would like to mention here that I'm not considering here the uh, contribution from interfaces. I will I will make a comment regarding this a bit later. I'm just looking at the uh, at the idea of bulk ferromagnets. So it appeared, however, that in certain type of antiferromagnets these symmetries may be broken. And in this case, it's not forbidden to have a band structure with momentum dependent spin splitting in this kind of antiferromagnets. And as a result, we should have non spin degenerate fermi circuits. As a reference, you can look at this, uh, this, uh, uh, this publications where this idea was, was introduced. So, as, as a result, it was argued that. Uh, the presence of non-degenerate spin uh, Fermi circuits can lead to spin-dependent conduction. So even though we have uh, we have same minimization, uh, we have uh, net minimization equal to zero uh, due to the fact that we have momentum-dependent spin splitting. The conduction may be spin-dependent. And uh, uh, please look at these publications which uh, discuss this idea uh, in a more uh, generic way. So from that perspective, uh, we can use this kind of antiferromagnets in uh, antiferromagnetic tunnel junction. And if you use a, the same two-spin channel model as I used for ferromagnets, we can argue that this kind of antiferromagnetic tunnel junction may have non-zero tunneling magnetic resistance effect. So imagine that we have uh, two antiferromagnetic electrodes that are the same, so they have same kind of Fermi surfaces showing schematically here by these two ellipses, but there is no overlap between these two Fermi surfaces. So they're different for uh, up and down spin electrons. So in this case, if you have a parallel aligned um, uh, male vectors, we, we have perfect matching between Fermi surfaces and up and down spin electrons would tunnel efficiently to, 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 their, uh, to the available states and the right electrode. On the other hand, if we now flip the, uh, all, the, all the magnetic moments, that means we switch the uh, male vector orientation, we have a mismatch between the Fermi surfaces because uh, spin assignment to this uh, uh, Fermi surfaces is reversed. And we should expect that conductance in this case may be much, uh, uh, can be stronger suppressed. So this concept, as you can see, is very similar to the idea of magnetic tunnel junction because we again are discussing, uh, we, we are discussing matching or mismatching uh, the Fermi surfaces. The only difference is that uh, we don't have uh, net magnetization. We don't have uh, net spin polarization, but despite this fact, because of uh, conservation, I, this important point I need to mention here, so this, uh, this assumption would work if you have uh, uh, 
conservation of transverse momentum in the tunneling process. Because if you have mixing between different, uh, different momenta, obviously this, this idea will not work. So um, again, I emphasize that this idea is similar to what we have in magnetic tunnel junctions. Now let us uh, discuss a specific uh, application of this of this idea uh, for some particular materials. So I will start from ruthenium dioxide. So this uh, this is um, material which was uh, kind of emphasized emphasized and discovered not so long ago. Uh, it has a rutile structure. Uh, it's antiferromagnetic metal with nail temperature um, uh, above the room temperature. It has magnetic uh, type A antiferromagnetic ordering where we have planes, uh, 001 planes with ferromagnetic alignment of magnetic moments. But if you go from one plane to the next plane, uh, the magnetic, moment, magnetic moments are aligned anti parallel. So the nail vector is, uh, is pointing along 001 direction as shown here. So what is important is that their magnetic space group symmetry is such that it breaks both PT and TT one half symmetries. So as a result, we should expect K dependent spin splitting and uh, spin dependent momentum dependent Fermi surfaces. And this is in, indeed as confirmed from uh, uh, from electronic band structure calculations, uh, uh, which uh, which results are shown here. So this is band structure for spin up and spin down uh, electrons showing in red and, and blue along high symmetry lines in the brilliant zone. And as you can see, along certain lines, we don't have spin splittings. So, and these are lines which, uh, which are sitting on glide invariant planes where Kx and Ky are equal to zero pi over to A. And this is because on that planes and on that lines, uh, uh, the, the glide symmetries hold, uh, holds. And, uh, and, and as a result uh, uh, of, the, of the presence of these glide symmetries, the, the bands by symmetry must be spin degenerate. But if you go away from these planes, for example, uh, we go along uh, this two uh, high symmetry lines, you see quite substantial spin splitting. So what is important is that this, splits, uh, the, this spin splitting uh, is, is driven, originates from exchange interaction. It's not due to spin orbit coupling. And th th therefore, this spin splitting is quite substantial. So um, as a result, we have uh, spin dependent Fermi surfaces, which are shown, uh, which, are, which are calculated and shown here. So as you can see the shapes of these Fermi surfaces, are uh, congruent. Uh, so the, the size of these Fermi surfaces is the same, but they are not the same if you, if you look at specific uh, K points in the brilliant zone. So in fact, they are related by uh, mirror symmetry uh, transformation. So as a result, uh, we should expect that in the, uh, in the conduction, specifically in the process of tunneling, we should have uh, difference for uh, two spin channels because of different Fermi surfaces. So what is important from the point of view of uh, transport properties is number of conduction channels. So it's a number of states which are contributing to the conduction. So uh, here we're considering uh, 0, 0, 001 direction for the conduction. And uh, uh, therefore, number of conduction channels is plotted in the two-dimensional brilliant in, in the 0, 0, 001 two-dimensional brilliant zone for spin up and spin down channels. So um, obviously the number of conduction channels is integer it's 0, 1, or 2 showing in color here. Uh, and as you can see, uh, the shapes also congruent as, as the shape of the Fermi surfaces. But uh, again, they're not the same. And specifically, this difference is, uh, uh, can be seen from the fact that we should have spin polarization of each conduction channel. So if you fix K parallel transverse momentum in this two-dimensional brilliant zone and calculate the difference between number of conduction channels normalized by, by, the, by its sum, you can see that we have a spin polarization which is distributed in this two-dimensional brilliant zone. We have plus one 
plus one or minus one or zero, depending in what part of the Brillouin zone we are. So as a result, we should expect spin-dependent tunneling, and we should expect uh, tunneling magnetic resistance effect, which can be simply explained uh, using this uh, this consideration. So, for example, if you are dealing with parallel states, uh, with a parallel state of the two electrodes, we have uh, same orientation of the network and two electrodes, and fix a particular k parallel point. For example, here, then uh, both in the left and right electrodes, we have for spin up uh, one conduction channel. This is white color here. But if you go to down spin uh, channel, we don't have uh, states here and conduction is forbidden. So this is for parallel state. If you go to anti-parallel state, obviously we flip the spin uh, designation uh, on, in, the, in the right electrode. And then while in the left electrode, we have some state available, we don't have the state in, uh, in the right electrode. And for both spin, spin channels, we should have transmission equal to zero. So this is a simple explanation why we should have higher transmission for parallel case uh, as compared to anti-parallel case. And that, that's driven by the Fermi surface mismatch for anti-parallel state. Now let's make this more quantitative. So let's, let's consider a specific example. And this example is antiferromagnetic tunnel junction, which is based on ruthenium oxide electrodes. So we, we are using uh, titanium dioxide as a, as a barrier layer in this, in, this, uh, in this system. So titanium oxide, uh, titanium dioxide is a, is a rutile. So it has the same, uh, same structure as ruthenium oxide. Moreover, the lattice constant matches beautifully. So we can uh, potentially grow uh, at the taxial antiferromagnetic tunnel junction and uh, potentially measure uh, this uh, thermodynamic magnetic resistance effect. Now, if you compute the electronic band structure, we see that the Fermi energy is nicely uh, positioned in the in the band gap of uh, of uh, titanium oxide. So we should have a uh, tunneling process if we compute conductance uh, using this idea. So let us first uh, show what happens if you have parallel aligned nail reactors. So what I'm showing here is calculated transmission in the two-dimensional brilliant zone. So for each k, k parallel, we compute transmission for spin up and spin down electrons. And this is the distribution in transmission uh, we can find from this computation. Uh, as you can see on the bottom, I'm showing uh, conduction channels as I've shown before. So you see there's some relevance between uh, these two, two plots. Uh, the difference is uh, mostly coming from the edges of the brilliant zone where transmission is substantially reduced because of uh, suppression uh, of the transmission away from the center of the brilliant zone. So if you now go from parallel state to anti-parallel state, now we switch the network in the right electrode and compute again conductance. Uh, as I've mentioned before, uh, we have now mismatch in the, uh, in, the, in the conduction channels in the left and right electrode. And now transmission is largely uh, located close to the center of the brilliant zone and, and substantially reduced, as you can see from this color plot. So if you do summation over all uh, K parallel to find overall transmission of the tunnel junction and calculate the normalized difference, you'll find TMR effect, which is of the order of 500 percent. So this is a very large effect, which is in fact comparable or even larger for tunneling magnetic resistance in best magnetic tunnel junctions uh, where we're using uh, NGO type electrodes. So this is quite sig significant, uh, significant finding, I think. So moreover, uh, so this calculation is done at the Fermi energy. So if you apply bias voltage, there will be contributions from different energies. So what we did here, we calculated transmission uh, as a function of, air, uh, of energy to go away from the Fermi energy, which is sitting at zero, uh, and then calculated uh, related TMR. So over all range of energies, we see quite substantial difference between transmission for parallel and under parallel states and quite sizable TMR. So it's somewhat reduced in this region, but 
Even here, we have sizable 50% or larger thermonic magnetic resistance effect. So we can argue that even in the presence of applied bias voltage, we should have sizable effect. Now, I would like to discuss um, uh, um, the effect of interfaces. I've mentioned already that interfaces are, are quite important. And I would like here to mention uh, previous work which was done on antithermagnetic tunnel junctions. And some of these uh, publications, uh, there have been uh, predictions of quite sizable TMR effect in these antithermagnetic tunnel junctions. I have to say, however, that all these publications we are uh, dealing with uh, fully degenerate antiferromagnets. And uh, the TMR uh, they predicted was based entirely on, uh, on the fact that we have interfaces. And in the computation, obviously, we can assume that interface is terminated in such a way that we have net monetization. And if you have net monetization, we switch antiferromagnetic order. The uh, ordering of the interface uh, switches, and we should have TMR, which is similar to what we should have in magnetic tunnel junction. So all the contribution comes from interfaces. In practice, however, we know that we always have interface roughness, and it's it's very hard to have uncompensated magnetic moment uh, at the interface. So it's uh, quite unlikely that this kind of antiferromagnets can be uh, can be used to realize a sizable TMR effect in uh, realistic experimental conditions. So this is not the case for uh, for our tunnel junction. So uh, we find that TMR is robust to interface termination because it's controlled by the bulk properties of antiferromagnets. So what I'm showing here is uh, the original configuration we used, I've shown before, we have parallel aligned uh, mail reactors, and this is uh, termination we use. We, we, we see that for, for parallel line mail reactors, the terminations were such that the magnetic moments at the interfaces were anti-parallel. So now let us change it. So we, we change the termination in such a way that now for parallel line mail reactors, we have parallel line magnetic moments at the interface. And we did similar calculation of transmission. So we see some difference. Now we, we, we see for parallel state uh, some disbalance, some difference between up and down spin electrons. But still, we have very sizable difference between parallel and anti parallel. Uh, configurations and the sign doesn't change. So everything is consistent more or less uh, uh, to what we found before. And even uh, TMI may be uh, higher as compared to 500% to, to, uh, I've mentioned before. So if you now uh, switch the, the moments, we, we change the interface termination in such a way that these moments are pointing in the opposite directions, we, uh, we uh, have a similar picture. Uh, we have very similar distributions and still very sizable TMR. So basically, from this uh, analysis, we can argue that uh, interface termination is not critical. And uh, in experimental conditions, we should expect uh, robust uh, TMR independent of interface termination. So another point to consider is spin orbit coupling. So all the calculations I've shown before were performed in the absence of spin orbit coupling. Uh, because all the splittings I have mentioned are not driven by uh, spin orbit coupling. And all the effects I'm, uh, we've been discussing so far uh, are driven by, uh, by uh, just um, uh, crystal symmetry and exchange splitting of these antiferromagnets. So if you now take into account spin orbit coupling and calculate uh, the Fermi surface of ruthenium oxide, obviously the shape. Uh, remains nearly the same because spin orbit coupling is not really substantial. There are some small differences, but not, not essential. And now what I'm showing in color is a projection of the spin to uh, Z, X, and Y directions. So as you can see, the contribution from X and Y directions are tiny. There are some small appearances at, uh, at, uh, re in regions where there are some crossing of the bands. Uh, and uh, moreover, if you look at the number of conduction channels and specifically to spin polarization of these conduction channels, we see very similar picture as we had before, except again, some regions where 
uh, bands are crossing, and uh, in this region, the spin polarization is somewhat reduced. Otherwise, otherwise, we have more or less same same distribution. So based on this, we can argue that uh, spin orbit coupling may be not as uh, significant, um, maybe not significant effect in this in this tunnel junctions. Though I have to say that it would be nice maybe in the future to perform calculation in the presence of spin orbit coupling because uh, in addition to uh, changes in the band structure, there might be some spin flip processes which may be important, but that uh, uh, still remains subject of future uh, investigations. All right, so um, at this point, I um, would like to switch to anti-thermometric tunnel junctions with non-collinear electrodes. I, I see that I have still uh, quite a bit of time. Uh, and as an example, I am going to consider a particular type of antiferromagnet, uh, namely manganese 3 team. So uh, this antiferromagnet uh, was in focus uh, of recent investigations uh, because of uh, interesting magnetic and electronic properties. In particular, it was shown that uh, the symmetry of this antiferromagnet is such that it allows uh, anomalous Hall effect. So it has, <clears throat> by symmetry, it has uncompensated magnetic moment. This is, by the way, different from ruthenium oxide, which doesn't have uncompensated magnetic moment. And it has uh, anomalous, uh, anomalous Hall effect. So uh, magnesium 13 has a hexagonal structure. Uh, it has magnetic moments uh, in 0, 0, 001 point. Uh, they're forming uh, triangular letters uh, and rotated by uh, 120 degrees, making uh, this antiferromagnet non collinear. It has a uh, quite high nail temperature, uh, 420 degrees Kelvin. So, um, this antiferromagnet belongs uh, to space group, which breaks, uh, which breaks um, um, Kramer spin degeneracy. So, according to this uh, symmetry group, uh, the bands uh, must be non-spin degenerate, could be must, uh, non -spin degenerate, and as a result, the Fermi surface should also have momentum-dependent splitting. So, however, the situation here is more complicated because now we have non-collinear magnetic moments, so we cannot uh, assign spin up and spin down to a particular state, and we should look at the projection of the magnetic moments uh, onto XY plane. Uh, so if you don't have spin orbit coupling, all the magnetic moments uh, are lying in XY plane, so we don't have Z component. So, and if you do calculation of the electronic band structure of this, uh, of this uh, antiferromagnet for a particular orientation of the male vector, uh, we find that <clears throat> the X and Y components change uh, if you go um, from one, one band to another and can switch from positive to negative. So if you now start rotation of the male vector, if you go to uh, 60 degrees rotated, 120 degrees and 180 degrees, we see similar rotation of the projection. So this blue-red changes to red and then red-blue and, and uh, similar, uh, similar changes occur in, in the Y component. So uh, we can conclude that um, the band structure is spin dependent and uh, the, the specific projection of the uh, spin um, uh, on, on, on these bands uh, depend on the male vector orientation. So as a result, we should have also spin dependent Fermi surface. So if you do a calculation and compute uh, shape of the Fermi surface, we find that there are three bands, band one, two, and three, uh, crossing the, the, the Fermi surface. Uh, and uh, similarly to, to, to the previous plot, we show here in color projection of uh, X and Y components of the spin uh, on, on this Fermi, on, on these Fermi surfaces. And on the bottom, we show a projection of the Fermi surface itself on uh, uh, 0, 0, 0, 1 uh, orientation, 0, 0, 0, 1 direction. So obviously, as you can see, uh, we have a spin-dependent Fermi surface, and the, as a result, we should have um, transmission, which should depend on the nail vector orientation. 
So let us consider, for example, band one. So this Fermi surface sheet showing, uh, showing here on the left. So if you look at the projection of this of this Fermi surface to zero zero one plane, uh, you see that this spin components uh, change from red to uh, red to blue uh, in a complicated way, uh, different from x and y components. Uh, similar to the band structure, if you now start rotation of the of the uh, of the main vector, uh, there is a, a rotation. Uh, um, or uh, rotation and changes the shape of the shape and distribution of the x and y components of the wave vector. So from this um, from this uh, calculation, we can argue that if, for example, we can see the particular k point, like uh, for example k point here, uh, and uh, assume that spin in this k point has a specific orientation in x y plane, then in the conditions where we have anti-ferromagnetic order, uh, anti-ferromagnetic male vector being parallel, we should have same orientation of the spin in the left and right electrodes as shown here. However, if uh, there is some angle between magnetic moments, then, uh, or for example, uh, okay, so what I've shown, sorry, what I've shown here is opposite. So. Um, when we flip magnetic moments from zero to 180 degrees, then we have complete mismatch between a spin orientation in the left and right electrodes from blue to red for X component uh, and also for Y component, uh, uh, some change, changes to the opposite. So however, if you have parallel orientation, we have a perfect matching. So we should expect from this simple consideration that there should be uh, a sizable tunneling magnetic resistance effect uh, driven by this matching or mismatching of the spin uh, 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 at the Fermi surfaces. So now let's show uh, results of, uh, of calculations. So in this calculations, for simplicity, we assume that there are two uh, magnetic uh, manganese 13 electrodes which are separated by vacuum barrier. So this is just for simplicity because <clears throat> All the calculations and all the idea is based on the uh, band structure of bulk antiferromagnet. So this is schematically uh, shown here. So this is uh, uh, this is uh, geometry of the tunnel junction. So what we do here, we fix um, orientation of magnetic moments at the bottom electrode and then rotate by angle uh, alpha uh, with respect to the bottom electrode, uh, main vector of the top electrode and Calculate transmission. So this is what is shown here. So angle equals to zero. We have quite complex distribution of the transmission uh, with red being high transmission. And now if you start to increase mismatch between, uh, between the nail vectors, so we go from uh, high transmission to lower and then eventually uh, from the contrast, you see that the transmission is substantially reduced. So if you integrate transmission over a brilliant zone, you find that there is a substantial reduction in the transmission when we go from parallel to anti-parallel nail vectors with TMR as large as 300%. Again, it's a, a quite sizable number, which is comparable to best magnetic tunnel junctions in, uh, based on ferromagnetic metals. So in addition to, uh, to TMR, uh, which is relating parallel and anti-parallel configurations, as you can see here, because uh, all these four um, orientations of the nail vector are possible because uh, they can, all, all, all four correspond to easy axis directions. In principle, this kind of tunnel junction may have uh, for non-volatile resistance states, which is additional advantage <coughs> of this uh, kind of non-collinear anti-ferromagnetic tunnel junctions. All right, so um, I think I'm coming to the end of my presentation. Uh, so what I would like to say in the conclusion is uh, a few things. So first of all, uh, we can see from this analysis that we can have sizable and robust uh, tunneling magnetic resistance effect in both collinear and non-collinear uh, uh, tunnel junctions, if you are using uh, anti-ferromagnets which have momentum-dependent spin splitting. 
and as a result, means can degenerate Fermi surface. So the effect is quite similar to what we have in uh, in uh, tunnel junction with tunnel junctions with uh, uh, crystalline uh, uh, crystalline tunnel junctions where we have k parallel conservation. So for realistic implementation of this kind of <coughs> effect, we have to have uh, conservation of the transverse momentum. So it is critical for this kind of effect to have uh, crystalline tunnel junctions where we don't have mixing of the transverse momentum. This is somewhat different from uh, ferromagnetic tunnel junctions. You remember that historically in magnetic tunnel junctions, uh, people used amorphous alumina electrodes and still sizable effects were observed. However, um, uh, only when uh, fully crystalline tunnel junctions based on NGO were used, the effects were sig significantly enhanced. So um, referring to this uh, finding, I hope that uh, similar uh, can be done experimentally uh, using this kind of tunnel junctions, especially for thinium oxide base, because we have a fully uh, oxide tunnel junction. So I, I'm pretty sure that this can be grown epitaxially, making them fully crystalline. It's somewhat more different, difficult, probably for the magnesium uh, team tunnel junctions, though I've heard some rumors that some effects have been already observed. I didn't see publications, but uh, this is what, what, what I know from uh, some of my colleagues. Uh, and um, um, uh, finally, I think the comment I would like to make is as follows. Obviously, in order to realize these effects, what we need, we need additional ability to control the nail vector. And this is very challenging, as, as you know. So for, especially for thinium oxide, which is uncompensated on the ferromagnet. It's easier to do for manganese 3 team because it has uncompensated magnetic moment and you, one can apply a magnetic field to switch the anti-ferromagnetic water parameter. But potentially, obviously, we would like to have for both, we would like to have electric means, uh, either electric current or voltage uh, to switch the anti-ferromagnetic water parameter. And this is challenging. This is uh, more work needs to be done. So at this point, I think I would like to stop. If you would like to have uh, more ideas about this work, you can read these publications. Uh, if you have any questions, I would, would, would be pleased to answer those questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kenny, for this interesting talk. We can use the reactions buttons to uh, thank the speaker. Uh, so we can now take questions. If you have a question, if you're on Zoom, please uh, raise your hand. If you're in Twitch, you can type your question into the chat box and I'll read it for you. Uh, Enrique Cobos, please go ahead with your question. Uh, yes, hi, uh, great talk. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Simbal. Uh, my question is, uh, you simulate uh, always these, these symmetric uh, structures uh, where you have ruthenium oxide on one side and on the other side, and the same thing with magnet 310. Uh, I'm wondering why it has to be symmetric. I mean, I know it's, it's convenient both for growth and for calculation, uh, but it seems what you have is a change in the, in the Fermi surface. So you could detect that with some other material that more selectively probes the part of the Fermi surface that is changing. Uh, have you have you simulated anything uh, calculated that sort of asymmetric uh, junction? Yeah, I think it's a very good point. In principle, uh, you probably are right, but um, one should find in this case such uh, such an electrode, such a non-magnetic metal electrode, where uh, there will be a symmetry in the Fermi surface in such a way that um, if yeah, you I don't have any suggestions. I don't have any specific suggestions. <laughs> yeah. One need, uh, I, I think it's a good idea, but I think one needs to think uh, regarding symmetry of this kind of metals, uh, which they should have in order to have a contrast when you switch the antiferromagnetic order parameter in the, in the antiferromagnetic electrode. Uh, I'm not sure that this is very straightforward. Uh, I need to think about this. 
But in principle, I think it's possible. Yeah, I don't have an example. I'm more familiar with the, for, for example, graphene that has, you know, not this symmetry at all, but uh, has, you know, states only at the K points and not much else. So it's a good filter for some, uh, some spin materials. Uh, but in that case, maybe you, you don't even need a tunnel barrier if the if the probe material is probing the Fermi surface in a particular way. Yeah, I mean, if you if you can if you can measure perpendicular transport, I mean, it's it's maybe very challenging to, to do it without tunnel barrier. I mean, we we we, we have CPP GMR and people use CPP GMR. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, Christian, go ahead, please. Yeah, hey, Evgeny, I could either come up one level and ask you directly or ask you a very, very exciting oh, talk. I, I learned a lot. I have a very basic question, which reveals that I'm an experimentalist. So when you introduce the, the uh, uh, tunneling uh, magneto resistance in general, in ferromagnetic tunnel junctions, but also in anti-ferromagnetic junctions, your argument always goes via a spin-dependent Fermi surface. Now, when yeah. I compare that from my naive uh, uh, introductory textbook knowledge about tunnel junctions, there the argument is always made about a, uh, a spin-dependent difference in the density of states at the Fermi energy. I would argue these two things are not exactly the same because if I only know the Fermi surface, I do, I do not know the density of states at the Fermi surface necessary, I would think. So uh, what's this? I see some disconnect here. Can you help me there? Yeah, in principle, I mean, in, in a simple picture, I mean, you can, you can argue that you have tunneling uh, from left to right, and you have certain density of states at the Fermi energy, and this provides you a certain number of electrons which tunnel from the left to the right. So in ferromagnets, uh, I mean, you may, argue that based on this density of states, you already can have a uh, tunneling magnet resistance effect because this density of states will be different for up and down spin electrons. In antiferromagnets, you can you cannot use this argument because if you integrate, uh, I mean, all this momenta, you will find same same result. So you need to have some selectivity in the in the, in the wave vector. And uh, this is somewhat related to uh, big effects which people observe in magnetic tunnel junctions based on MGO. So MGO selects tunneling uh, from iron, for example, of a particular band. And this selectivity comes from, uh, from basically uh, distribution of the transmission in the uh, two-dimensional brilliant zone. So not all bands tunnel uh, equivalently, so you, you when you're talking about density of states, you integrate over all bands, but because of this selectivity, only particular band tunnels, and this this band uh, in iron is kind of half metallic, so this band uh, is present for upspin electrons and doesn't present for downspin electrons. So this uh, selectivity in the uh, in the K space is responsible for. Uh, basically giant tunneling magnet resistance effect in, in this kind of tunnel junctions. So my argument, if it's possible for uh, uh, ferromagnetic tunnel junction, it's also be possible for anti-ferromagnetic tunnel junctions. But again, uh, I emphasize the fact that the major difference here is that this is critical and important condition. You need to have really conservation of the transverse momentum because if you don't have it, then you allow kind of channels where you flip the spin. So in, in that sense, uh, in this, I don't know, is it answer, does it answer yes. your question? Yes, yes, I think so, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, there is a question in, in chat in Zoom from uh, Saurabh uh, Harwar. The question is the following, is it possible to obtain magnetic resistance without any center oxide layer with the same materials. Without barrier layer. Without the barrier, yes. Okay, so in that case, you, you, you would have, just have a domain wall. Yeah, if you don't have a barrier layer, then you have a domain wall. So then uh, question is how thick is this domain wall? So this is somewhat, <clears throat> um, I mean, in principle, answer is yes, uh, unless 
the domain wall is so thick that you have kind of coherent uh, rotation of the spin. And if you have a broad domain wall somehow, uh, in principle, uh, this will lead to uh, interface resistance or domain wall resistance, which uh, may be non-zero. So in principle, the answer is yes, but uh, likely the effect will be much weaker. Uh, and, uh, but it, it should be non-zero, I mean, ideally. Mm -hmm. And also from, from the point of view of measurements, it might be, I mean, we're talking about thin film. So, I mean, if it's a metal, measuring conductance perpendicular to the plane is, is very challenging. So typically we would like to have some resistance and, and that's why tunnel junctions may be useful, maybe not thick barriers, but there should be some separation. So to separate magnetic structure of the left and right electrodes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any further questions? So let me ask you something. So I believe uh, you, you showed two configurations, parallel and anti-parallel. Yeah. And this is what we, what you expect for perpendicular anisotropy. If the anisotropy was in plane, you can in principle have any angle there. So you could have orthogonal nail vectors in orthogonal directions in the plane. Um, You're talking about collinear type of current. Yeah, uh, same system, uh, same ruthenium oxide, but if the anisotropy is in plane, Right, the magnetizations would be parallel to the interface, and they could make any angle. So, is there anything interesting there, or would you have something sinusoidal as a function of angle? You no, know, I, I think, I think uh, yeah, that, that needs to be investigated. So, in principle, um, we considered uh, the case when. Um, Tunnel junction is grown in zero, zero, 001 direction. So in principle, uh, similar uh, similar systems can be grown, let's say, in one, one, one or one, zero, one, zero, 001 directions and so on. So in this case, magnetic moments may be not perpendicular to the plane. So um, specific of this particular uh, uh, situation is that if you if you integrate over the whole brilliant zone and calculate number of conduction channels or Fermi surface. Uh, integrated, so you, you don't have any uh, any any dif any uh, any difference. So uh, from that perspective, I mean, if you integrate over to the natural brilliance zone, the number will be the same. So from that perspective, the overall conduction, if you would like to measure the whole uh, conductance uh, or conduction for up and down spin electrons, should be the same, independent of, of spin orientation. However, if you go to some other direction, so if you uh, if you think that the, your transport is not uh, uh, is not uh, is not um, parallel to magnetization but perpendicular, you you will have already asymmetry uh, in the number of conduction channels because of the asymmetry of the Fermi surface. So you can imagine that now instead of this direction perpendicular, you have let's say this direction, and obviously if I go along this direction, there is a huge asymmetry as compared to this case. So uh, I think that there was, uh, it was already mentioned in a number of previous publications that if you, if you think about just conduction along this direction, there should be uh, some spin asymmetry even uh, in the bulk on the ferromagnet if you neglect, if you neglect any spin flip scattering processes. So I think that that should be also reflected in tunnel junctions, but uh, whether effect will be stronger or weaker, it's probably hard to, to immediately Claim. I think that the specific calculation is needed to, 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 to look at this, but certainly there will be, uh, there will be uh, some effect, no doubts. Well, my, my question was slightly different. So uh, what I meant is if you take the exact same structure that you have, right? So with the growth direction zero, zero, 001, okay. but here in the calculation, because uh, there's no spin orbit coupling. It doesn't matter what is the orientation of the spins in space, right? It's only the relative orientation that matters. But uh, 
you consider parallel and anti-parallel, and those are the only two available configurations if the anisotropy is perpendicular to the interfaces. But if the if the anisotropy is in plane, then the Niel vectors, uh, they are both required to lie in the plane, but the angle between them can be different from zero and 180 degrees. You could have 90 degrees or maybe intermediate angles as well. So I was wondering about the angular dependence here. Would you expect something simple with maybe so, a cosine of that angle uh, or is there something more complicated? So you're suggesting that I keep orientation here as it is and rotate this one uh, under a certain angle, or you, you're, you're saying that I have an isotropy where I have rotation in both type of electrodes and then... Yeah, you, you can have them both in plane, right? If the anisotropy is in plane, in plane then and in your picture, they would lie in the plane that cuts through the uh, this line. So I think, Kirill, in this case, you need to look at the symmetry. I'm not sure that the magnetic group symmetry will be the same. It will change. I'm not sure that we will preserve um, well, we'll, we'll Without spin orbit coupling, it shouldn't matter. I mean, the, the, the relative orientation of the k vector and the spin doesn't even enter the Hamiltonian. So it shouldn't matter. No, and I, if you calculate I, parallel and anti parallel. This. What I'm saying is that if you go back to this idea of spin dependent Fermi surfaces, so this is driven by magnetic, uh, magnetic space group symmetry. So if magnetic orientation is not along zero, zero, 001, but along, let's say, uh, along x or y axis, then the magnetic space group symmetry will be no, different. I, no, I, I, I don't think so. The magnetic space group, like the standard magnetic space group is irrelevant here if there's no spin orbit coupling. Um, well, that's it true. doesn't matter which direction the right. spins are pointing. That's true, yes. Yeah. We are talking about spin orbit coupling, so the presence of spin orbit coupling. No, I'm I'm talking I, I'm talking about the case where the two magnetizations are not parallel, the two Niel vectors are not parallel. So instead of parallel and anti-parallel, they could make some angle between them. Okay, and it could be realized if the anisotropy is in plane, and they, they can just rotate like this. Okay. So then it would be not a bistable state, but uh, yeah, it would be an angular dependence. There will be some mixture, right, between this. Um, I suppose, yeah. But I mean, I don't know. The mixture. most natural thing will be some sort of cosine dependence. Yeah, right. Like in tunnel junctions. I think so, yeah. Okay. Uh, another question from chat. Um, following the previous questions, is it feasible as a tunnel junction to work with the antiferromagnet oxide ferromagnet structure. So antiferromagnet is one electrode and ferromagnet is the other. Um, in principle, yes, I think it's possible. Uh, but then we lose the disadvantage. We, uh, or I mean, keep ferromagnet fixed and, and switch down the ferromagnetic order parameter. All right. Um, or maybe the other way. You can, it's easier yeah. to switch a ferromagnet. That's easier. Yeah, I think it's possible. Yes, I think, uh, I think it's possible. So but if it's possible as a detection method, isn't it, uh, wouldn't it be nicer because it can actually have magneto resistance? It, it will be easier, obviously, but I, this is, this, uh, we are losing them the point of, of switching kind of ferromagnet fast and then, uh, the whole story. Oh, but I mean, if this is a detection scheme, but uh, I think it may be a bit problematic because, like in this case, you, you have something that breaks the um, rotational symmetry, but with a ferromagnet on the other side, you need also um, to have some some need to, some you need to break the symmetries there as well. Yeah, for full rotational symmetry or something like this. Mm -hmm. it's good, it could not be just an ordinary uh, cubic type on the Yeah. Okay. Uh, Gunashil, please go ahead with your question. 
Yes, hi everyone. And uh, I have a question regarding manganese three tin. So what you showed that there can be these four different resistance levels, let's say, if you look at the antiferromagnet. My question is the Kagome plane there in, in case of manganese three tin, they're both in plane. So this kind of relates to uh, Professor Belashenko's question in the sense that you can have six different, let's say, domains of the of the octopole vector in the mangan in, in manganese three tin. So I would expect to see more than just four states. And I was wondering if you had any, if you could, yeah, explain it to me a bit more simpler as to why there are only four and not, I don't know, twelve or three because you could have uh, two domains so let's say the top manganese three tin is has a uh, octopole vector along 120 degrees and the one that is at the bottom electrode is at zero or 180 and in this case we would also see uh, an intermediate tunneling resistance. So you're saying that there should be 30 degrees here in, in, in the middle between this two, right? Yeah, so you have uh, zero. So, I, I mean, not all angles are here, but I think that you can have six different states, not just the four that are presented here. Uh, could be. So, but I mean, if I rotate this one by 30 degrees, that will be. A, that will be. A I mean, there will be there will not be a ground state, but if you rotate it by sixty degrees, then you have another ground state. Yeah, this will be cool, yeah, It's right? not about thirty. Like you, you, you take the state with the sixty degrees and reverse one of them. So if yeah. reversing the electrode from zero to one hundred eighty does something, so it should do something in that case as well. So as far as I remember, we looked at this and we found that these are uh, uh, kind of ground states we should have. Mm -hmm. But what, what about 240 degrees? Should be also the ground state. Yeah, 240 should be, right? yes, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but it can be different from 60 because a rotation by 180 degrees is not an equivalent operation. I think that was the point. Yes, that is the point, yeah. Yeah, we can continue rotation by, uh, by 60 degrees to come back to this one, that's true. Uh, But in principle, it's positive that it's possible that 240 for some reason is equivalent to 120. I think it should be equivalent. Uh, Basically, it's flipping 60 to the opposite direction, right? Uh, yes. yes, that's what, yeah, that will be 240. I think it will reproduce basically the same features. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there may be some symmetry operation. And uh, I mean, I have another question. It's a lot more uh, material science oriented is if I imagine a manganese 3T tin tunnel junction, what thickness of the tunnel junction should I be considering? And is there any effect of disorder at the interface here that prohibits the TMR? I mean, you showed that the, the ruthenium dioxide, it does not have any, let's say, interface constraints. And even if there was, there's no 
um, yeah, you still have a large TMR, but in this case, what would you expect? Do you have any idea? It's a very complicated question, obviously. I mean, interfaces uh, are very essential. And uh, as I said, uh, I mean, from my perspective of a, of a theorist, I, I don't know, uh, I mean, how, I mean, what kind of structure uh, can be used to, to grow uh, fully petaxial town junction. I know that people use MGO. I think that that was what I heard. Uh, it's a tunnel barrier, but obviously MGO uh, does not fit to um, a crystal structure, doesn't have hexagonal structure, and so on. So uh, there is no, obviously, epitaxy at the interface. And what effect that should produce is hard to say. So again, uh, I think that uh, from I mean, what our understanding, what is really critical is a K-parallel conservation. So we need to be sure that there is no um, uh, momentum scattering and uh, uh, disorder at the interfaces or uh, tunnel barrier where we have, let's say, not direct tunneling, but some defect assisted tunneling or resonant tunneling mm -hmm. would make uh, a possibility, would create a possibility to uh, for scattering of K-parallel. And that obviously will reduce the effect quite substantially. So how strong the reduction will be, again, uh, special analysis is needed, so it's hard to, it's hard to say. Okay. Um, but if there is no scattering, is it fine if I have um, a tunnel barrier that's, I don't know, 10 nanometers? Or does it always have to have a certain distance? That very, thick, very thick barrier is not, is not, uh, is not appropriate because uh, we know from I mean, all the experimental studies and theoretical studies that if you go from thin barrier to thick barrier, uh, there is a, a, a transformation of the tunneling process. So typically for thin barrier, uh, the tunneling is dominated by direct tunneling. If you, have, if you make it very thick, then probability of conduction channels through some disorder states increases dramatically and the uh, tunneling regime changes. Uh, substantially. So, uh, as far as I know, even for aluminum based, alumina based tunnel junctions, uh, never uh, barriers more than four nanometers were considered. Uh, and in case of MGO, it's two, uh, kind of one, two, three nanometers or something like this. So, uh, I don't think that, I mean, 10 nanometers would work. Yeah. So, certainly that should be much thinner. Okay. Um, yes, thank you very much. Again, I think even if the tunneling is preserved, a thick barrier is not good because it will restrict the tunneling to the immediate vicinity of the gamma point, and there is no effect of the gamma point. Yeah, there is enough. Yeah, this is a good point. Yes. Okay. I think we're out of questions. If there's another question, raise your hand right now. So if not, let's thank you again.